Today I'm presenting 18, a multimodal spectroscopic approach to the characterization of low concentration and highly similar biopharmaceuticals. Nimble and Bioform in their vaccines roadmap published in 2018 pointed out that up to 70% of vaccine manufacturing time is spent on the QC process, that product release times are typically weeks to months which could potentially be shortened to one to two days with appropriate multivariate sensors, multivariate analysis, and predictive modeling. Now, vaccine manufacturing is well established and has historically been comfortably slow. The drive to shorten product release times may not have been particularly strong in 2018. The pandemic has changed that thinking and highlighted the need for rapid product release testing timelines. Gene therapies, on the other hand, are a relatively new therapeutic modality and growing rapidly. These are quite complicated therapeutics with genetic material incorporated into viral vectors and delivered to patients. These therapeutics have also largely been developed in academic settings, and part of their path to future success will rely on scaling the manufacturing process to meet commercial demands. Although the therapeutic advances grab the headlines, it's the analytical scientists working in the background that make commercialization a reality. Vaccines and gene therapies are typically formulated at quite low concentrations. Micrograms per milliliter or fractions thereof are typical. If we're looking for a rapid analytical test that can be used at or online, Spectroscopy is typically where we look first, but low concentration samples provide a bit of an analytical challenge. The go-to tools for rapid analysis, FTIR, Raman, and near infrared, they struggle below one ppm. And this isn't taking into account complex matrices, which I'll explore a bit later. Just to note, this is a log scale and each tick is jumping by a factor of 10. So this takes us to molecular spectroscopy. UV-Vis is better able to characterize subpart per million concentrations, but it still doesn't approach the LODs provided by separations via HPLC. But as getting away from slow separations-based analytics is what has us looking at alternatives in the first place, we need to keep looking. And that brings us to multidimensional fluorescence approaches, A-team and EAM, where EAM stands for excitation emission matrix, are able to achieve potentially part per billion or part per trillion LODs. Chromatography versus spectroscopy. I'll briefly compare these approaches to the characterization of mixtures. Chromatography, the constituents of a complex sample are physically separated by entraining the sample in a solvent mobile phase and flowing it through a column or stationary phase. The separated components are detected as they flow over a suitable detector. The axis on a chromatogram is time and the peaks represent the separated pure components. Spectroscopy, on the other hand, relies on photons to gather a spectral trace and mathematical analysis to separate the components. The overall spectral profile of a mixture reflects the superposition of the spectral profiles of the components. Each component will itself give a complex trace. There is no one peak equal one sample equivalent that's seen in spectrochromatography. However, it is possible to mathematically identify the trace for each component. The tool that enables this is math or multivariate analysis. Whereas method development for chromatography is based on finding the combination of mobile phase, column, and detector that provide the best physical separation of the components, for spectroscopy, it's finding the best mathematical algorithm to separate the complex spectral profiles. Collecting data in spectroscopy is typically much faster and less expensive on a per-run basis than chromatography, making it an appealing tool for process analytics. Getting back to vaccines, uh, here's a list of components for the Shingrix vaccine with 0.1 mg per mil of the active. The two most significant components in this product are water and sucrose, and this is quite common. 
So the ultimate target for vibrational spectroscopy and manufacturing has been to displace slow and expensive chromatography techniques. But from these collected references, we can see that low concentration samples in complex matrices, like a typical vaccine formulation, these tools aren't going to work. There is a hundred times more sucrose than protein in a typical vaccine formulation. And this is an unsurmountable problem for ramen. And the 0.1 mg per mil of protein in water is essentially an unsurmountable sample for near infrared and FTIR. So what are our options? What about 3D fluorescence? <clears throat> this molecular spectra, the question then is, what about fluorescence? This molecular spectro spectroscopic technique has promising LODs. What about the matrix effects that interfere with vibrational spectroscopies? Interestingly, in the blessing and a curse category, for samples to be visible with fluorescence eames, they've got to contain molecules with native fluorescence. This happens to work well for biological samples as the aromatic amino acids, mostly tyrosine and tryptophan, they fluoresce, and their fluorescence response is sensitive to their environment. Signals change based on exposure to water or interaction with RNA and DNA, for example. Non-fluorescing sample components, they essentially disappear. So sugar and water, not going to show up on an eme profile. This makes fluorescence quite a powerful tool for the characterization of protein-based biotherapeutics. Many of you are probably familiar with 2D fluorescence, these traces here on the left, either an excitation trace at a fixed emission or an emission profile at a fixed excitation wavelength. These 2D traces are used routinely and they're not considered to be very highly information rich. It's important to distinguish though between 2D, the traces on the left, and a 3D matrix fluorescence technique or EAM, excitation emission matrix. As the EAM is an entire matrix of the excitation and emission space, you can see from the structure of these matrices that there is significantly more information to be gleaned from the a full 3D experiment than there is through a single excitation or emission trace. Uh, one of the problems historically has been the time it takes to collect these entire profiles, but we'll be presenting a technique today in using a two-dimensional detector, a CCD, where the entire uh, emission profile is collected simultaneously and all you have to do is scan through the excitations. So the pattern of an EAM, another limitation with them, is that it can be distorted by the self-absorption of a sample. This is called the inner filter effect. This effect can actually alter the shape and position of fluorescence features in the EAM. The good news is that it can be mostly corrected using the absorbance spectrum of the sample. Uh, in this image, the trace labeled B is the absorbance spectrum of a sample, and the matrix labeled C shows the wavelength dependency of the IFE correction. This is the actual uh, IFE correction matrix that we will use to correct the, the sample EAM. You can see the wavelength dependency in the fact that at the, the, the bottom left-hand corner, the low excitation emission wavelengths, there's significantly more correction than there are for other areas in the matrix. So the pattern of an EAM, excuse me. So to correct a 3D EAM, you collect the absorbance spectrum, you calculate the entire IFE contour. So you divide the uncorrected EAM um, by the IFE contour, and then you obtain corrected data. So this seems like a very promising step, uh, gets us corrected data, but what are the limitations here? For standard EAMs, the absorbance correction is collected on a different instrument. Temperature changes, optical path differences, et cetera, can all impact what we'll call the goodness of the correction. So now we're finally getting us to A-team, uh, the method that I'll be talking about today. 
A-team combines two different spectrometers, absorbance and fluorescence, in one instrument. So now the data that is needed to create that IFE uh, correction contour is collected on the same sample at the same time. This clears up our molecular fingerprint. With this inventive tweak, the two spectrometers in one box, the difficulty in adequately correcting for concentration effects is resolved. And A-team can be used for the rapid screening of very similar samples. And it's not just the correction capabilities of having this two-in-one approach. You essentially end up with five unique parameters from a single sample. The extinction coefficient and absorbance spectrum, along with these three fluorescence parameters, the fluorescence quantum efficiency, as well as the excitation and emission spectrum, the entire uh, 3D matrix. These five variables provide what has what turns out to be quite a unique molecular fingerprint, and that we found for protein-based biologics, these five parameters are quite efficient at providing unique identification of very similar samples. As implemented on the Aqualog, A-Team also meets the USP specifications for both UV-Vis spectroscopy and fluorescent spectroscopy. Remember, we're, we're working with these two techniques at once. So even though the combination of the two is kind of a, a novel application, it's still using well-established spectroscopic methods for which there are USP uh, chapters that define what you need to do in order to get validatable results. So with traceable reference standards and automated methods, we are able to do that with the so now comes the fun part where I'll turn to the applications and show that the performance of A-Team for the differentiation and characterization of vaccines and AAV viral vectors. I have samples that I'll start with were provided by the Vaccine Research Center of NIH. We first wanted to establish the LOD for these particular samples and formulations. Using the RMS method, we were we estimate that the LOD for these samples is approximately 0.15 microgram per milliliter, so in line with standard vaccine formulations. We had five samples that we wanted to um, see if we could differentiate. They were differentiated in turn by a couple different features, post-translational modifications, uh, amino acid substitutions, and an old versus new batch where the old batch was more, much more aggregated than the new batch. And what we show here is a very simple principal component analysis. Again, we're using math to differentiate between these samples. And what we see is that we are readily able to distinguish between these five samples. So clearly demonstrating the selectivity and sensitivity of the technique for this problem that we've thrown it. Uh, this was a promising start for vaccine characterization. So then we moved on to uh, the next set of samples. Uh, actually, I do want to mention here, I'm, I, I said before that the, the fluorescent handle that we have for these samples is tyrosine and tryptophan. But it is not just tyrosine, tyrosine and tryptophan that we can see, uh, in many cases, we can see the effects of other samples or other components on the tyrosine and tryptophan. So for instance, the amino acid substitutions between these vac uh, vaccine formulations were not tyrosine and tryptophan that were substituted for different amino acids, but, but different amino acid substitutions the impact of which we were able to differentiate in the signals from the tyrosines and tryptophan. So we can think of them almost as a reporter uh, to allow us to see changes that maybe aren't necessarily directly the tyrosines and tryptophans. So moving on to the next set of samples, we purchased four over-the-counter multi-component vaccines. And these are canine vaccines, and they were available commercially at our friendly neighborhood tractor supply store. These samples are highly similar. The table on the right shows the different components within the vaccine formulations, uh, as well as the uh, excipients. Of note, Sologec 9 and Sologec 10, a nine component and 10 component formulation respectively, they differentiated 
only by the presence of the corona, well, not the, a coronavirus vaccine for Sologic 10. Again, this isn't the coronavirus. This is a coronavirus that was already in circulation when these uh, vaccines were formulated. But it's interesting to note the only difference between these two formulations is a single vaccine component. So they're very obviously highly similar. So we prepped these by reconstituting the samples by the package instructions. We diluted them further uh, with uh, DI water. This was a cuvette based measurement. Um, we, there were two of each sample that were measured on two separate days to look at the reproducibility. And then there was a third sample collected by a different operator on a different instrument for uh, reproducibility and model validation. These are the truncated and corrected AT matrices showing the distinctive patterns of these vaccine components, including the amino acids. Uh, the table on the right shows standard excitation and emission features of biologically relevant molecules uh, that may or may not necessarily be represented in these vaccines formulation. So moving on to the results. As I said, we collected the same sample on two different days. Uh, these sable, samples are labeled S5 or S-5 um, and on out for the different vaccine components. And what we can see here, um, the the same vaccines collected on different days cluster so tightly, it's difficult to actually see that there are two different days data under these ellipses. And also that these four different vaccine formulations, which are quite close uh, in terms of their, their, <laughs> their match, are actually very well separated by a simple principle component analysis. And this is um, using three components uh, established about 93% of the variance between these samples. Then we wanted to go and test the reproducibility of these of these systems. So we collected a new set of samples on a different instrument by a different operator. And I do believe this was actually a different batch of samples and added this to our model um, to, to test our ability to find, uh, to classify unknowns based on our model. And what we see here is that there was 100% correct classification of our unknowns, these uh, U5 through 10 using uh, the model that we had developed previously on the S5 and S-5 um, S samples. And this was five repeats of the four vaccine products. And you can see very good 100% uh, classification of these different components. So clearly we're having the um, well able to differentiate between these similar components. We're able to do that reproducibility. And because of our tying back to standard reference materials in the USP cat chapters able to do that in a validated way. All very promising. Um, based on our successes here, we decided that we would continue on and do something a little more challenging. Uh, we wanted to see if we could use the capabilities of the A team to characterize AAVs, uh, adenovirus adeno-associated viruses, which are used as a viral vector to deliver gene therapies as well as vaccines and 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 other therapies. We were interested in knowing whether the A-team was capable to differentiate the empty full ratio, and this is a CQA for AAV manufacturing, and also able to differentiate between AAV serotypes. Uh, the serotypes are typically based on the surface proteins of these AAV capsids. Uh, with obviously, uh, you know, quite, <laughs> quite similar, but still uh, differences in the protein environment. We were able to buy uh, com commercially sourced capsid references. So we were ordered samples of the AAV2 and 9 serotypes. And for each of those, we had empty and full. So this table shows the, the level of emptiness or fullness of the, the um, genetic capsid loaded into the viral vector. These are the 18 fingerprints of these four samples, uh, the empty on the left versus full on the right. And the top row is the AAV2 serotype and the bottom row is the AAV9 serotype. So we have this kind of matrix of the empty versus full or AAV2 versus AAV9 serotype. And the, the emission max on filling 
on having a genetic material in the capsids resulted in a, a shift towards uh, longer wavelengths of the emission wavelengths. And one of the potential explanations for this is some type of exposure to a um, to water that can change the tryptophan signature of, of the um, for the the ene fingerprint. But when we did a multivariate model, in this case, we're using Parafac, which is similar to a principal component analysis, but kind of extended into three dimensions. We find out that the these two samples, the empty versus full, were differentiated by this uh, this fingerprint. And what we see here is that the the difference between empty and full is actually based on the quenching of a one of the components. So the addition of the genetic material in the viral capsid more strongly quenched one of the components than the other. So we're, we're getting a, a measure here of the um, of the the interaction of the of the genetic component with the proteins in the capsid. And what we can see here also, one of the things we did was titrate the the empty capsids with full capsids. So we took these samples and mixed them together and were able to get this very nice um, linear correspondence for these samples. So we believe that it's possible to, again, these are, these are standard reference materials. These aren't in-process samples, uh, but we're the, the information here is quite interesting that our ability to uh, generate a, uh, empty versus full ratio uh, seems quite promising for these samples. And again, this is quite robust. We used an extreme gradient boost uh, discriminant multivariate model and cross-validated the prediction as a function of full versus empty AAV9 capsids and got this very nice uh, linear relationship between the predicted and the measured uh, level of fullness for these samples. So in conclusion, we see that uh, A-team is potentially a faster and easier, compared to chromatography, competitive analytical technique for PAT. So in that sense, it aligns well with other spectroscopic techniques, the vibrational spectroscopic, near-infrared, FTIR, and Raman. However, A-team differs from the vibrational spectroscopic techniques in that it can be used at low concentration, and it's very sensitive in terms of its discrimination and quantification capabilities. Um, the A-team also differs from EAMS, again, at describing that um, the ability to collect both the absorbance and the fluorescence data on the same sample at the same time kind of extends the dynamic range for quantification, provides these um, five parameters for discrimination of the different samples and has, has shown extremely um, robust uh, discrimination and quantification capabilities. In terms of differentiation from separations of chromatography, um, the ease of use, the lower per run measurement cost because we're not dealing with columns and standards, and the speeds. Um, it's a spectroscopic technique, so it tends to work in a matter of seconds rather than minutes. Um, and in terms of quantification, has similar reproducibility and repeatability to our uh, chromatographic techniques, as well as those low limits of detection that are important for these types of biopharmaceutical therapeutics. So some of the potential target applications, as I mentioned, you know, we kind of touched on vaccine lot release. Also counterfeit detection, the ability to differentiate a a, a real batch from something where someone has counterfeited the vaccine formulation, uh, the A team should be able to distinguish that quite quickly. Contaminant detection, this full empty ratio for viral vectors, specifically the AAVs, as well as the cell surface protein differentiation, uh, telling the serotypes of, apart. We suspect it can be used for process monitoring for the the analysis of these low concentration samples that the other spectroscopic techniques can't access because of their uh, limits of detection and the complex aqueous matrices of biopharmaceuticals. The antibody drug conjugates might also be a target, uh, and we have also done some very preliminary work on the characterization of exosomes, seeing the same kind of uh, performance as we saw for the AAV differentiation.
So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time today and um, and appreciate your your attention. Thank you so much. And also thank you for the organizers for the invitation.